So welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming along. I appreciate there is a lot of good choice at this conference, so I do appreciate you spending the next 45 minutes with me. We're going to be discussing continuous delivery with Docker and Java. I'll introduce myself in a second, but do set a bit of the context. I've been working in this field for four or five years, I guess, with, with both the technologies. And I think the perception is a bit different than the actual reality of the situation. Yeah? The kind of pitch is we have our monolithic apps, we carve them up, we put them in containers, we ship them, and we are good to go. Yeah? The reality is many of us have tire fire applications. Yeah? I know I've accidentally written my fair share of tire fire apps in the past, things that evolve out of control, a couple of frameworks in the mix, all going a bit, bit wrong. The problem is when you combine container tech with stuff that's not quite good anyway, let alone good for container tech, what you end up with is literally tire fire in a container. Yeah, this is not a good look. You, one sort of good thing is you'll notice the first responders in the bottom right there. This is what we refer to as DevOps in our industry, and this is how I make my money in the UK uh, putting out fires. Yeah. Uh, in all seriousness, today I'm going to give a high-level talk of some of the good things I've seen with containers in Java, some of the bad things, and some of the things which I definitely recommend you don't do, mistakes I've made, Try and avoid them. I'm sure we'll all make our own mistakes. We're, we're destined to do that. But I always like to learn from other folks at conferences not to repeat sort of their mistakes. Stand on the shoulders of giants. I'm not saying I'm a giant, but I've stood on the shoulders of many other giants at this conference. Uh, this is me, at Daniel Bryant UK on Twitter, on GitHub, on LinkedIn. I've pretty much cornered the market on the interwebs with that name. Uh, I have a interesting background, I guess. I was an academic for a while. Java is my native language. I've done a bit of ops, I've done a bit of architecture. I still write a fair bit of Java, not as much as I'd like, in all honesty, um, but I do a lot of continuous delivery work. Uh, I've recently published a book with my awesome uh, co-author, Abraham Marin Prez, Continuous Delivery in Java. That will go into a lot more depth of what I'm going to talk about today. Today is a high-level thing. Deep, deep dive in the books. The uh, one on the left there is actually free, courtesy of Nginx, the continuous delivery in Java. But uh, uh, sorry, containerizing continuous delivery in Java. But the other one's a full O'Reilly book you can get on Safari. Uh, if you are interested, these days I'm doing a lot more work in the app modernization space. A lot of stuff with API gateways, with service mesh, with Kubernetes. I work with Ambassador and HashiCore quite a bit. Oh, sorry, I work with DataWire, I should say. And I also work with Ambassador and Console Tech from HashiCore. So if you want to come and chat to me afterwards about this kind of stuff, I'm more than happy to. I'd love to kind of pick your brains on how you're getting on with migrations of apps, old world to new world, these kind of things. But back to the scheduled program, what we're here for, continuous delivery and Docker, yeah, with a bit of Java. Let's refresh ourselves. A lot of the value I add these days is bringing folks together and reminding them of key principles. In the past, I've definitely got a bit excited about technologies, definitely Docker. Got quite excited about Docker, got quite excited about Kubernetes, service mesh, but I realize we're all here for a reason, to deliver value. Yeah, be it actual business value, or if you're working for the government or an NGO, value is delivered in, in a different kind of way. But in the modern kind of era, velocity and stability is key to organizational success. Unless you're building like nuclear reactors, different kind of thing there. But predominantly, we're trying to get to market fast. We're trying to do it stable. We're trying not to get breached in terms of security. We're trying not to fall over regularly when customers flock, uh, flock to our site. Friend of mine in London, Steve Smith, many awesome books from Steve, well worth checking out, has this great saying, yeah, continuous delivery is achieved when stability and speed can satisfy business demand. What that kind of says is you know your context better than I ever can. If you can create a pipeline with whatever technology, Jenkins, you know, GitHub Actions, whatever you want, if you can create a pipeline that meets the speed and stability requirements of your business, you are winning. Probably time to look at another problem, if you've got that kind of thing going on, rather than making it gold standard. But I see many folks not quite internalizing what continuous delivery is all about. And I'll go into some more depth in a minute. But I'm sure many of you have seen discontinuous delivery, where you can't go as fast as the business wants, or if you do, stuff falls over a lot. I've been there, yeah, for sure. Really key thing, stability and speed. Remember this as we go through the talk. This is really quite a key thing. Apologies, is probably a little bit small, but hopefully nothing new. This is a standard Java build pipeline, standard Java delivery pipeline. I'll point through some of the things. So we're coding on our local machines. Maybe we've got IntelliJ spun up, whatever. I love IntelliJ, all that good stuff. 
we're committing to maybe a centralized repo or something like um, GitHub, SVN, C CVS, or CSV rather, or CVS. Um, we're then building, say, with like Circle CI, Jenkins, and in the traditional Java world, we typically push to something like uh, Artifactory or Sonotype Nexus, maybe a jar, war, ear, whatever your flavor is. We then take that artifact, we deploy it onto a QA environment, do some tests. We, if it works, we push it along to staging, maybe do some more realistic tests. Maybe QA, we're mocking. Uh, staging, we're using sandbox environments, PayPal sandbox, for example. And then if it all goes well, we push to prod, yeah? Now, continuous delivery doesn't end there. I'd argue it actually starts there. The key thing with continuous delivery is getting that feedback loop going. Yeah. Are you learning in terms of business metrics? Did this idea we all had actually work? Is it delivering on our KPIs? Is it delivering on our, on our promises to our customers? But also, you know, is there something we can learn in terms of architecture? Is there something we can learn in terms of operational? You know, are we burning CPU or are we flooding you know, queues or networks or whatever? These, I'm, I'm, to be honest, I'm not going to talk about this too much today because it's a topic in its own right. And many other awesome people like Cindy Shridharan, uh, Copy, um, Copy Construct on Twitter, also Charity Majors, Mipsy Tipsy on Twitter, both of them talk about these things in a lot more detail than I, I do, and they do amazing kind of blog posts on this stuff. So well worth looking at this kind of thing. Closing the loop is really critical. But we're going to focus more on the actual pipeline today because that's more where some of the Java stuff that mistakes I've made come into it. So the good with Docker and Java, the good is we can container, we can Dockerize, containerize. I may use the two terms interchangeably. They're not. Docker is a kind of brand, if you like, of a container tech. Apologies if I do switch between. I use Docker mainly, I'll be honest. But you can um, Dockerize your dev environment setup. This is quite nice. Docker all the things. I know Netflix, they have quite a complex build chain, even locally. So they put all the things in a Docker container. That's nice and portable. You don't have to pollute your machine with lots of brew installs or APT gets, all this kind of good stuff. Docker enables repeatable builds. Once you've built your jar, put it in a, uh, an image, done the config correctly, you can crank the handle, deploy multiple places, scale out, all that good stuff. I love my Star Wars, so it's kind of a bit like the clone army in my mind. You can just keep cranking the handle and out the containers pop. And I'm not, you know, on camera, so I'm not going to name any names, but everyone's got that favorite app server they love to hate, yeah? And um, you can basically seal these in a Docker container. So you don't have to have multiple versions of whatever sitting on your dev machine. You can hermetically seal those kind of dangerous app servers or whatever technology you're using into a container, which I think is really nice. Now, as a technical leader, as an architect, our choices are all about trade-offs. There is never a right and a wrong, very rarely a right and a wrong. It's all about trade-offs. Docker containers have their trade-offs too, yeah? The, the bad stuff is kind of like this classic, you know, why is this container image one gigabyte? It's just a Hello World Java app. I've got my Go app over here. It's like 20 megs. What's going on? Yeah? And, you know, I know I've been using Java for like 15 years or whatever. It's got a bit of a sort of like a, a legacy almost of being a bit verbose, being a bit big, and some of it's, you know, fair, to be honest. Um, but there is some tricks we can do to get rid of some of these challenges with size and with resource consumption. I'm glad someone knows, like, dinosaurs must have completed their dev test deploy loop faster than me. And I'm not sure, but when you add a new abstraction in the mix, often if you're trying to do that kind of what you're used to with the monolith, where we could literally just spin it up, do some coding, hot reload, see the results, commit to, you know, GitHub, and, and off you go, the dev loop now, if you've got containers in the mix, can be a bit more complicated. Add microservices, add a microservice like architecture or a loosely coupled server type architecture, you've got multiple components in play. Maybe you've got multiple data stores. How do you now spin all that up and, and do your testing, do your dev loop? So that's definitely something I've spent quite a bit of time on, and, and we cover that quite a bit in the book as well. And the classic one I had, and I, I'll share this like, uh, at the end, was um, this Java app runs slow or it freezes. Yeah, in Docker. It's fine on a VM, fine on bare metal. As soon as we put it in a container, we leave it for a week and it suddenly freezes. And I actually had that problem. My team luckily found the answer and I'll share it with you. And many of the folks have, have kind of commented on, on some potential causes of this uh, as well. So there's no such thing as a free lunch or free beer or free Coke, whatever you want to say. <laughs> Coca-Cola, I should say there. <laughs> the impact of container tech on CD is kind of fourfold, I like to say. We've got our pipeline here, 
Um, I think it changes like this. So from this to this, and I'll walk through each step here. The first one is now you probably want to install Docker or some kind of container tech on your local machine. Some companies I work with do try and abstract containers away from engineers. I generally shy against that because I think mechanical sympathy, or we as engineers understanding the platform we're deploying onto, we, we write better code if we do that. Same with the cloud. If you don't give developers access to the cloud tech, I, they, will write bad code, in my experience. I've certainly messed up a bunch of stuff. But in the cloud, everything's on the network. You need to understand that. With a container, it alters the runtime fabric. We as engineers need to understand that. So I heartily recommend installing a Docker on local machines, teaching engineers, getting them to play with Docker, do their tests. We'll cover that more in a minute. The way we now store artifacts is different. Probably you don't want to store your jar or your war anymore. You want to store the container image. You want to put the jar, the runnable jar in the image, or you want to put the war in an app server and put that in an, in an image, for example. Again, your mileage may vary. I've seen all, all different types of things. But predominantly and anecdotally, my experience is that now people are committing container images to a registry or a repo rather than jars. Some do both. The way we test now is different. We're going to want to spin up a container image. We're going to want to spin up a container and test it, because we can't just spin up you know, something that's going to be deployed differently into production. This is really key. And of course, your deployment fabric, your actual orchestration is probably going to fundamentally alter. You're going to be using something like Kubernetes, Mesos, ECS, EKS, that kind of thing. I'm not going to talk too much about that, but do recognize that, again, mechanical sympathy you have to understand the platform you're deploying onto. Yeah? Think, for example, with Kubernetes, things are a lot more ephemeral, a lot more transient. So when you're building apps, we've got to recognize that they might be spinning up and spinning down a lot more than they did when you're on bare metal or on VMs. Always remember, though, we're trying to push things down as fast as possible, and we're trying to make it as stable as possible. One of the key learnings I want to share with you, and I'll mention it a couple times with my uh, patterns, is that now the container image is what I call the single binary. And I take this from Jez Humble and Dave Farley's classic continuous delivery book, which is well worth a read, even though it's 10 plus years old now. Fantastic book. One of the key advices they give is build binaries only once. Because then if you build it and you test it and deploy it into production, there's less chance of drift of building multiple things and testing them and then building something different, putting it to production. I'll, I'll cover some more of that in a minute. But build binaries only once. And now the container image, in my general experience, is the single binary. So some lessons learned. I'll walk through a couple of stages of the pipeline where um, I've made some mistakes myself. I've seen some mistakes, for example. The first, and it goes without saying even with containers, but make your development environment as production-like as possible. Yeah? I, I do strongly believe that you know, I, I can get my dev loop going on with IntelliJ and maybe a Spring Boot app or a micro-profile app, for example. Um, but before I commit that code to um, GitHub, I will spin it up in a container, make sure the config still works with the code changes I've done, for example. Because you're going to be deploying that container. By all means, work really fast in a local dev loop, but before you commit, put it in a container, do your tests. Do use identical base images, and we'll explore the base image concept if you're not familiar with it, but basically it's the OS within the container that your Java app is running on. I had one project we were working on, I joined it late, uh, the team were using Ubuntu and coding away, all going well. They went to push to production, and the uh, ops team said, we only run CentOS in production. That's what we're licensed for. That's what we've kind of built a, a pipeline up for. And it totally made sense, yeah? The, the dev team, unfortunately, had not engaged with the ops team up front. And they, they liked Ubuntu. They thought it was you know, fine. But we, couldn't, we had to wind some stuff back because of some subtle differences with the config, security config between Ubuntu and CentOS, for example. Dockerfile con content is super important. Uh, are people generally familiar with Dockerfile content? Can I have a quick show of hands? Because I talk to all different types of audiences. Yeah, but 50-50, I say, actually, so that's worth explaining. So this is really a manifest, if you like. Um, you can think, you know, your classic Java manifest, for example, but here we're going to bring in some extra stuff, like the from is kind of the base image, the OS, if you like. We're adding uh, an artifact, a, a Java artifact, a jar. We're exposing some ports, and we're saying on line four how to run the thing. Even if you're not familiar with Docker, the kind of syntax there should hopefully speak to you. But that's a very simple 
Docker file. Like, it gets super complicated super fast in my experience, particularly if you're working with um, legacy systems. I had one Ruby system I was working on. I think we had 60 lines of crazy bash to get it running in a container. Because um, it used Passenger and it used all like, weird database connections and stuff. Um, so there's a lot of choice. And a lot of engineers I work with, particularly in bigger organizations, like they are not operationally aware. And there's nothing wrong with that. They like to write code. They're very good at writing code. They have limited time to learn. We can't expect them to know everything. Yeah. I like doing ops, I've learned it, but you know, your mileage might vary. But there's a whole bunch of things you need to think about here. Making the OS as small as possible for runtime consumption, for attack surface, for security. The way you configure the OS and put the build artifact in there. Do you go Oracle JDK, Open JDK, JDK, JRE? And some of you in the audience are probably thinking like, JRE, you know, JDK, it's obvious in production what you'd run, but you'd be surprised at what I've seen in my consulting. I've seen literally full fat Ubuntu images with a JDK running in production before. So you don't want to do that, <laughs> and I'll cover that in a minute, but I've seen that. And we've got more choice these days. Hotspot, OpenJ9, Graal, Substrate, all that kind of good stuff. Because I mentioned people are often doing containers where their workloads are more transient. They're spinning these containers up, short-lived, dying, and Java is kind of built of the era where it was running for days, you know, or years sometimes for apps. Now people are looking at things like ahead of time uh, compilation instead of just in time. They're looking at things like class data sharing and application class data sharing, which George mentioned in the keynote uh, uh, yesterday. And lots of choices. To a lot of engineers, this is confusing. Uh, you know, I certainly was when I started. Bottom line is talk to the ops team in your, in your company. Talk to the InfoSec folks, talk to the platform team. Their operational knowledge is invaluable. And but no, rule number one really is that engaging people. You know, I, I've worked on too many projects where we you know, kind of didn't engage with the, folk, the right folks. And at the end, you ma reach, ma reach massive operational hurdles and political hurdles. Yeah. So engage with the ops folks early on in your company. It better to be difficult up front than difficult at the end is my experience. I mentioned a few times, starting with good base images is really key. Yeah? Um, I'm a big fan of using the OpenJDK stuff. We'll dive into it a little bit more. Um, if you haven't heard, there is some changes around OpenJDK and version 8 and the Oracle thing. I'm not going to go into it. I've said my piece a little bit online. I'm luckily part of the Java champions. Martin Verberg and many other people in the community have got some amazing blog posts out there that clarify how licensing has been changed now with some of the things. Uh, I use the Adopt OpenJDK build farm to get my OpenJDK binaries. Azul do, fant uh, Azul do, sorry, do fantastic work. Red Hat do fantastic work. There's many places you can get your binaries, not just Oracle, much as I love Oracle, of course. Thank you for code one. Um, just be aware of this kind of stuff, yeah? <laughs> so uh, just be aware is what I'm saying of this kind of stuff. We've all got to make money, so I totally get why Oracle have changed their licensing model, um, but we as engineers, uh, have to recognize some of the legal and some of the um, money kind of aspects of what we do. Get off my soapbox for a second. Um, and now, yeah, going more into the technical details. So a lot of folks I see sort of start with OpenJDK 8 uh, image up there, or, you know, pick your number, um, 11, 13, whatever. Um, this is a good start, particularly if you're, say, actually coding within a container. But obviously, it's pretty massive. Yeah, you, got, you see the end there, 657 megs. You don't want to put that in production for a whole bunch of reasons, because you don't want to put a JDK in production. But um, what folks often then discover, a bit of Googling, a bit of interweb searching, is they can use something like Alpine. Now, Alpine is just an OS. It's a very small OS. Um, so we get rid of a lot of cruft. But that very simple Spring Boot app, which I had previously with 657 megs, with Alpine, and I also pinned the versions of the JDK. We're using update 181 and Alpine 3.8. I've massively reduced my container size. If I go even more sensible and use the JRE, which I'm deploying into production, just the Java runtime environment, no JDK, I can get it down to about 116. Yeah. And if you use something like uh, Azul Zulu or this Project Portola, which I'll mention on the next slide, you can get it down, the, the smallest I've seen it is about 40, 50 megs. Yeah, so you can get it down pretty small. Um, you know, this stuff is extra work. Post Java 9, you can use JLink to create custom uh, binaries effectively, native binaries. You can, uh, where it sort of compiles everything into the artifact, and you don't even need a, a JRE on the machine because it's all there. Um, there's things like Project Portola, Azul Zulu, which do some um, clever stuff around, because um, some of the issues with a big uh, container size in terms of an actual container image is to do around the glibc and the muscle. Um, uh, 
library in C. And some technical details, I know a little bit about it. Like I can point you some more resources if you want to know more, but that's the kind of tricky part. And Project Portola is an open source effort to make that better. And Azul have already got an implementation of um, Alpine with Muscle C, which is super lightweight. You can get there. But whatever you do, please do test. Yeah, this stuff is, I, I, I've only seen a very, I've really heard, I haven't actually worked on, I've only heard of a couple of companies in London that very specialized use cases were trying to minimize super small their, their Java runtime. It's doable, it's not free by any means. So one of the like, sort of second questions after the setting up the config is why is my image so big? Yeah. A couple of tools I'm going to share. If you haven't, but I mean, I'm, I'm a massive Maven fan. I know it's a bit old school. And Gradle's the cool kid, but I like Maven. So sorry, a couple of Maven examples, because I mainly use that. But Maven dependency tree gives you a nice overview of all the dependencies you've got going on. And if you bring in something, it's very, it often brings in lots of transitive dependencies. And it's nice to just understand, could you substitute this library for another one? I've, I've seen a few projects where we're just using some really um, simple string utils out of, like, I think it was a spring library. And it was bringing in pretty much all of spring for a string utils thing. So we swapped that out for some Apache Commons stuff. So understand what's going on. Same with um, dependency analyze. You can look for unused dependencies um, and unused. You gotta be a bit careful. We're trying to pull out, like some folks, we, we looked and we were seeing unused dependencies in our jar, which we didn't need, but they're actually needed at runtime. So Maven's not perfect in this respect. It's a kind of um, build time analyze, whereas you often run time, there's some reflection magic or some other magic going on. But again, these tools will help you understand what is going into your jar. Next tool is super cool, nice graphic. Got to give a hat tip, it was to Alex Goodman. Not my work, it's Alex, massive hat tip to Alex. This is a tool to step through the layers within a Docker image. So each line in the Docker file adds a layer effectively and you build it up. And there's some little, like, catches in there that if you build some stuff up and then you don't delete it correctly, it can kind of accumulate. So this tool, you can effectively step through each layer and, oh, I'm installing a JDK here. What does it bring into the file system? Oh, I'm installing my app here. Where am I touching the file system? It's a really nice way, again, to just understand a bit more about the artifact. The tool is called Dive. Well worth it. And I, as an example, I had to play around with, I think this is uh, OpenJDK 11 uh, a couple of months ago with Oracle Linux. And you can see in the top left there, uh, I think the, uh, there was a, the, the first one is the first line at the top there, 117 megs, is the OS itself, Oracle Linux. The second line is um, just installing some utils. And the third line uh, is the JDK. And if you actually see on the next screenshot, as soon as I move down from the second layer to the, to the third, um, that's actually some sim links. But you get an idea of, oh, that's an area I need to investigate. Suddenly, I've got loads more files in this part of the uh, operating system, that kind of thing. Really nice tool. So hat tip to Alex. Building in containers, the multi-stage stuff, this is about a year or two old now, I think, is really useful. So I mentioned before, you want to treat your container images as the single binary. Yeah. The pattern we used to have before we had multi-stage courtesy of Docker, or had tip to Docker, was we used to have that scripts where we had like a build container, which we used to spin up with test utils and, and kind of do all, all our tests. And we used to have a script that then lifted out the binary from that container image and put it into a runtime image. So I had a full fat OS over here, some test data, um, maybe running a JDK, and then the actual production image was a JRE, super lightweight, Alpine. We used to have to have a, uh, Alex Ellis actually created the builder pattern, and he kind of, um, there was some very cool uh, ideas. With multi-stage, you can literally, if you see on like line one, we're using a Maven image, we're calling it as build, and then line seven, I'm doing my usual Maven build, and then line seven, I'm copying from build to um, actually the, the line six Docker image, if that makes sense. So yes, it's two images. We're building in the Maven one and sort of ultimately deploying into the Alpine image, but all my config is in one file. So for me, the single binary thing is still kind of valid because like, though there is two, two steps or multiple steps potentially for the build, the interesting thing is we only get one output which we run all our tests on, the second um, of the multi-stage builds. Uh, Docker at, um, I think it was DockerCon last year, I introduced something called BuildKit. This is still kind of early, but maybe worth exploring. There's some more fun stuff you can do with um, 
with stages, with, with build kit. The performance is meant to be better when you're building like uh, rapidly, which is interesting. This is Docker stats, not mine. And there's some cool stuff they've done with context mounts. I think they've changed the name now, but effectively it's a great way to do caching. And if any of you have tried to build Docker with Maven, say, in a uh, build, sorry, a Java app in a Docker container, you'll notice when you change dependencies, you literally, you blur away the layer and then Maven downloads the whole world again. And if you keep changing dependencies, it's very easy to be downloading lots of Maven dependencies all the time. So with the caches here, you can effectively mount a direct, an external directory into the container while you're doing your dev loop locally, and it will do a best effort caching as well. All right? So that's quite a useful thing to, to play around with. The real anti-pattern I'm seeing is the differences between test and prod containers. Yeah? I've seen some folks, they create sort of a test version of a container, full OS, um, JDK, test tools, maybe a MySQL in there or a, you know, a in-memory data store, and then they go and create a prod version of the container. Good intentions, totally, but it's very easy to see app configuration drift from what you think you're going to deploy and what you actually deploy. Showing my age, I'm a massive fan of the Gremlins movie. For me, it's a little bit like the test container, you're sort of feeding the Gremlin after midnight. Yeah, oh, sorry, you're feeding, not, you're feeding, you're feeding the, um, the, the, I forgot the name there, but what I'm trying to say here is if you, if you overfeed the test container, uh, it's very easy to see a Gremlin emerge. Yeah, so do think about these things. It's, I totally get why folks want to do it, but I think the good pattern for this is have the one image that you're going to deploy into production, but use what's called sidecar containers to have bundle other things. And be it if you're using Docker Compose or Kubernetes, you can often find ways of pairing the containers together. So there's a thing that ends up in production, your actual production image, and you might have like a secondary container with a data store with some test tools in it. If you're in Kubernetes, you put them in the same pod for example, with Docker, you can bind them. There's various ways you can do it. I strongly advise against doing the test and the prod different containers. Just think of the gremlins. If you feed the test container too much, you will get a gremlin. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of clever patterns you can do with the multi-stage build. You can do like multiple kind of tests. So in the middle there, I've got like I've called it on line six as integration test. I've seen some files where they have kind of the building of the image up top, multiple stage of, of uh, multiple stages doing various tests, performance tests, security tests, all that good stuff, and then a release at the end. And with BuildKit, you can do some kind of short circuiting. So if you just target to build the release, it will only build the dependent stages. So you, you can run all your tests in the pipeline, but if you're just looking to build the release, you can just target the end. In this case, because it copies from build on line 12, it will make sure that this is run before that as well. So like the, the multi-stage thing is quite powerful. That's what I'm trying to say, really. A couple of deep dives into, or a couple of other, sorry, high-level bits around working remotely and, and sort of locally. I often find with microservice systems, you cannot run it all on your laptop now. So this is a slight aside to the thing. I wrote about this. I was working with an awesome company in London called Open Credo a few years back. My team and I, we kind of brainstormed, and we've shared some ideas on if you are starting to work with microservices, how do you mock effectively? How do you virtualize effectively? Because you probably can't spin everything up on every data store on your, on your laptop. So it's all about sort of pr probabilistic kind of trade-offs, uh, real, realism versus probability of, of kind of failure. So here's some ideas there. One of the reasons I went to work with DataWire, fantastic tool called Telepresence. If you're in the space, it's an open source tool. It's a CNCF, a Cloud Native Computing Foundation tool now. If you're in the Kubernetes space, it's a great way to effectively proxy your laptop into a Kubernetes cluster. Nice two-way proxy. So I've actually, I think I've got a blog post. Yeah, I have. A um, blog post where I was debugging using IntelliJ locally while I was working with a remote cluster. And Telepresence puts a, swaps out my Java app actually in the pod with a proxy proxies all the traffic to my laptop and back, and I can just run my normal debug tools locally. Other tools do exist, but this is not, Telepresence is not the only one, it's the one I use the most, obviously, because I've worked with DataWire, um, but this kind of stuff I find is very useful when you're dealing a lot more with bigger systems, and the systems are distributed and in the cloud, for example. To that note, um, Shahid, fantastic blog, hat tip to him. I've talked about this at a bunch of conferences. Ellen Corbs does a lot of great um, stuff in this space, too. Um, I can give you more links, but the, what we call the DevX, the developer experience, often alters with containers. Uh, I learned some lessons the hard way. These, these are some reference for you. If you are moving into the container space, be aware that your tool chain may alter, and there may be some slight snags uh, 
compared to how you traditionally kind of do that in a dev loop of code, test, deploy, that kind of thing. So check out those references. Moving on, so the kind of the actual building and, and the um, storing in the artifact. One of the key lessons I learned in this space is metadata. Yeah, well, I think this again is almost slightly separate from containers, but I, I noticed it in particular. A whole bunch of security things popping up in the news, be it in the UK, be it in the US. Um, the, you know, professional teams are targeting even small companies now, let alone state actors with the Googles of the world, for example. But a lot of problems originate with people not knowing what's running where. Yeah, and if you put stuff in a container, it's very hard to understand what you put in there sometimes. And microservices, people lean away from Semver, they lean to Git SHA, um, these kind of things. But what I'm trying to say here is there is mechanisms for containers for you to put all this metadata in the container. So if a, a vulnerability, a zero day hits, you can use it as a kind of you know, trace to understand what's deployed where. This, I think, is, is something I've learned the hard way. So in a big company, it's knowing you know, what, when do we build this thing, what's the image name, who built it. And you can also do clever things with like cryptographically signing images. So the QA team does their tests, they sign the container image, and then we can verify that before deploying the container into production. I'll give you a couple of tools in a minute. You can do that. But putting metadata in, you can use a build time labels. So Docker's got a very nice labeling system, namespaced, you know, all what we used to in this sort of like with our Java imports, that kind of namespacing. A couple of tools there I was going to leave, leave for you. Um, Ross Fairbanks and the uh, MicroBadger team have done amazing work on giving advice around how to structure labels and what kind of metadata to put in your containers too. I often find I augment the build time um, with additional metadata. And Docker at the moment isn't very good, or it's not possible really to update the labels at runtime. If you do that, you create, you create a new container, a new image, sorry. So that's not, it kind of breaks my single binary thing. So if you want to add, so if you want to do testing and add um, additional metadata after the fact of the image being built, I've just stored the metadata in, in Artifactory or Nexus. Docker have got a couple of commercial products like Trusted Registry. Google have got some very interesting stuff called Graphius and Critus. Excuse my British pronunciation. I'm not exactly sure how it's pronounced, <laughs> but Graphius, Graphius or Critus. Um, and they, uh, in their GKE, their hosted Kubernetes offering, there's a way where you can cryptographically sign Docker images and ensure that only signed images will get through to production. So you can have the security team doing the tests with a the key. They then sign the image. They hand it off to the QA team. QA team, if it passes, sign the image with their key. And you can say, only if these keys are present on the image, does it actually go through to production. So hat tips Google for leading the way in this. I think many other organizations will follow. This being able to verify what the container has been through, what kind of testing it's been through, and then deploy it is really quite powerful. Moving forward to the QA uh, section now. Um, so on what I advise is, you know, definitely don't stop doing your kind of, you know, your, your staging environments or whatever. But when you're moving to a sort of more container-based microservice system, if you can, try and do component testing. So try and say, if you've got to spin up, like, you know, you obviously want to test unit testing, integration testing within your apps themselves. I'm not saying don't do that. But you probably want to test uh, a few services together. Because now I find, you know, microservices, to do something useful in a business context, often there's a couple involved. And again, things like Docker Compose in this example, um, Kubernetes, there's a few uh, tools, um, Micro K8s, uh, K3S by the Rancher team. They're like mini in-memory versions of Kubernetes, which you can spin up. You can deploy a sort of subsection of your app. You can then just run a bunch of tests against your normal endpoint, like an API gateway or just an API, for example, uh, these things. So don't forget, standard unit, standard integration tests, Definitely do your you know, pre-production testing as well, but I like to run some stuff actually in containers in a kind of lighter weight environment, and there's tools out there to do it. In particular, I love doing my load testing. Not like It's not soak testing or not necessarily um, like sort of hardcore production style load testing. It's more of a case of watching for degradation of performance. I had a couple of projects where we were microservice based and we only noticed um, a massive performance issue when something fell over the cliff. When we actually looked back, we'd been committing code to this one uh, microservice, and it was teetering on the edge, and we committed one extra line of code, which completely destroyed the performance of that service, which destroyed the performance of our whole system. 
Now, if we've been tracking the performance of that one service, like just running simple tests against the API, we would have seen the performance doing this. We would have tried to fix it before it fell off the edge. Yeah? So I definitely recommend, if you've got like, sort of very central, very important subsystems in your um, applications, spin them up, use something like Gatlings just to exercise them, and use, say, Jenkins or Circle CI to graph the performance of a kind of hot path through all the, the primary path through the application just to watch for trends, really quite key. Because Docker will alter the performance characteristics as well uh, of, of the runtime environment sometimes. I'll cover some more security testing in a minute. A fantastic talk by Aaron Gratifiori. It's quite an old talk now, 2016, but I've learned most of my security stuff from Aaron. Yeah, so I'm not saying I'm a security expert, definitely not, but Aaron is, for example. He did the CIS benchmarks and the CIS papers. This, I wrote it up for InfoQ. Hopefully a useful jumping off point for you to give to your set InfoSec team or just for you to understand, like I, I learned a lot just about the new attack uh, vectors introduced by, by containers, for example. Containers have got a lot better with security, but back in 2015, it was, there were some definite gaps, but they've got a lot better. But that advice still stands. Um, a lot of people talk about speed, so I'm just going to dump a, sort of, a few things on the, on the screen now. Um, migrating to the latest Java, I think, often helps, even if you're not using all the latest and greatest features. So Java 11 is the LTS version. Uh, I see a lot of folks having success with Eclipse OpenJ9. This is the IBM claim. I'm not going to substantiate it, but I put it up there out of interest. I have clients that have worked on that. People are moving to AOT, as the graph shows. Uh, JIT will give you the better performance, typically in the long term. But if you're spinning up apps in a container and destroying them, maybe AOT will give you more stable, good performance. Yeah. So and things like application class data sharing, where you kind of load up the, all the um, class files and then save it to a special file so you don't have to next time parse all the class path and reload it in, can really cut down boot times. So do check these things out. But again, from my perspective, whatever you do on these kind of shortcuts, these, these tricks, do test the app, because they can change certain things. Do it, you know, test it in your pipeline. Stability, I had a couple of classics, actually, in 2015, I think it was, we were working on this. Um, there's a whole bunch pre-Java 8 update 131. It was fixed in, actually, Java 10 and then backported. Um, the JVM didn't respect or didn't see properly the number of CPUs on the host. So, for example, we had, we had uh, Amazon boxes with, like, 64 cores in them. We only gave each container a couple of cores, um, and the... The runtime is clever enough, it's enforced, so each Java application running on this massive Amazon box only got the processing power of a couple of cores, but the JVM looked at the host and thought it had 64 cores to play with. Yeah? So when the JVM boots up, it goes, oh, I've got 64 cores on this host, it does the GC threads, the default fork join pool, nothing really breaks, but the performance is a bit wonky, because yeah? when it tries, you know, its algorithms are optimized then for 64 cores, and it's only got access to two, you know, it goes a bit, bit strange. This has been fixed and backported, but if anyone's running like JDK 6 or whatever, be aware that you may have like, subtle weird performance issues in this respect. I made a bunch of mistakes with memory. Do recognize like, the heap size, perm gen, metaspace, whichever version of Java you're running on. Um, do size appropriately, or your apps will be getting um killed within Docker, within the container OS. So I had a bunch of weird things where we set like 10% overhead on the heap size, uh, and we had a very thread-intensive application. It was creating a lot of threads, and it was burning through native memory, because each thread requires native memory in addition to like heap size, heap space. So we learned some lessons there. Your mileage may vary. You have to test, basically. If you've got a very thread-intensive app, you may need to give it more memory. And the last and the weirdest one was entropy. So now with, you know, with these massive Amazon boxes, 64 cores, 32 apps running on it, they were freezing. It was a Spring Boot app. Um, we couldn't figure out what's going on. It was running production for a while and freeze. Eventually, we figured out it was only freezing on cryptographic operations, token generation, sign on, that kind of thing. We caught it. We managed to step through the whole stack trace. And we figured that it was yeah, literally blocking because dev random was blocking. Yeah, the actual OS, if you like. And it's because when you're running all these apps on this box, there's very little entropy. The system uses entropy to generate randomness. And on a normal machine, if you're banging the keyboard and the network ports, the system's very clever at capturing that as randomness, as entropy. But you've got these boxes in the cloud with all these apps running on them. The entropy is quite small, and it gets exhausted really quickly. So what we did is we switched to dev urandom. And urandom on the operating system is a pseudo-random 
uh, generator. It never runs out of randomness. There is subtle differences between urandom um, and devrandom. I put some notes on this. I'm convinced that for the majority of cases, devrandom is the way to go. There is some folks that are not convinced. So I wanted to present both sides of the argument. Uh, I've got like, a hat tip to, um, is it Andy or Math Matthew? I think it's Matthew Gilliard. I learned a bunch. He's done an even more in-depth talk on um, this in the past. He proper deep dive into all the weirdness. Most of it's been fixed now, but if you're running old JDKs, you might bump into some of these things with Docker, for example. Right, looking pretty good for time. Final furlong is with security. So did a whole chapter in the book on this because I think it's really important. And by coming to code one, you're pretty much saying you're, you're a professional, or you're an aspiring professional in software engineering. And I think we as an industry need to take more responsibility for this stuff. Yeah, I'm not going to get on my soapbox too much, but I think we as engineers, we are starting to be legally held accountable now. I think that's a good thing. But we need to step up before we get regulated by other government uh, entities, those kind of things. So basic stuff, you want to like find sec bugs, awesome static analyst, an analyzing tool. It's caught a bunch of things on code I've worked on, like using um, random in Java wrong, and um, people doing uh, uh, CLI injections, SQL injections. It's a static analyzer, so it only captures patterns of code, but it's very good as a sense check. Chuck it in Maven, chuck it in Gradle, you're all good. Gives you a nice report as well as to things it might have found. Your code is really important to check, but obviously you're bringing in lots of dependencies too. Yeah? You, like most dependencies, fully in open source, are written by people like us. So we all make mistakes, yeah? So it's worth double checking other folks' code, various ways to do it. I like to use a OWASP dependency check. A SNCC is a very good commercial tool. If you're, I've got no affiliation, but I like their, their products. Um, but when I'm using open source, I use OWASP dependency check. It's literally a you know, 10-liner in Maven. Uh, we had a Spring Boot app, which we left. We didn't deploy into production. We left it, I think, for three months. We ran um, the build again, and we spotted, I think it was five new vulnerabilities in the app, just in three months. We bumped the versions of all the offending dependencies. There's a logback dependency, uh, some other dependency, XML vulnerability or something. We bumped all the versions, the latest versions, and all the dependencies went away. All the sorry, vulnerabilities went away we were more than happy to have these 10 lines of code in our, our POM, yeah? Because that, that could have been an exploitable kind of vulnerability. Nice um, tool there if you do want to scare your management as well. You can go, look at this, all these scary things, and then we need to fix this, which is, I find is quite useful. So if, you, if the carrot doesn't work, use the stick of Maven reports as a, as a technique there. And of course, you know, on the topic of this today, container images add another layer on top. I've used Claire a whole bunch, open source con uh, container scanner. It scans the OS effectively for things like Heartbleed and Dirty Cow, all that kind of random stuff that you see online. Uh, uh, Claire was part of CoreOS's offering. Docker, uh, Amazon, all the big names now have got uh, commercial scanners, which I highly recommend paying for. Money well spent, uh, in my mind. If you want to go open source, there's Claire. Um, running it's a bit awkward. I'm not sure if it's maintained that well now. So the only thing worse than running like a, you know, not running a security tool is running an unmaintained security tool. Yeah, so do check that. Um, Armin, hat tip to Armin. He's, um, he actually created an open source project that bootstraps the Claire scanner in a container. So you get the inception thing going on where you've got a container in a container where you can scan a container. It's all very good stuff. But again, the actual Claire um, project, I haven't done my due diligence on late, uh, of late. I've been using Aqua more late. Uh, the commercial offering, fantastic. You do have to pay for it, of course. Um, the free version gets me along quite a long way. Um, you literally, uh, the free version is invasive because you have to put a, a run line. You have to get a token from them, and you have to put a run line in to scan your container. Not ideal, but you know, more than enough to get you started and get you looking at their products. Um, just an example, so I did a scan on, and it was OpenJDK 8 about a few months ago. There was a couple of um, vulnerabilities, apologies if you can't um, see, it was two vulnerabilities, one high, one medium. Um, I then fired up an older version of the JRE, so same, um, same kind of config, but just an older version. It was only, at the time, a year older, so the client was running a much older version, actually, of the JDK. But just in that year alone, the number of vulnerabilities had increased from two in this modern version to 10 in this one-year-old version. Uh, and there was three high vulnerabilities. So again, every layer of the system these days you need to think about. Yeah, really, really important. I get quite a lot of pushback in agile environments um, saying that we don't think about scalability and we don't think about security until the last responsible moment. 
Now, I like the concept of the last responsible moment. See, if you're building features, you, you, know, you want to get as much information as you can, you make the decision before it's irresponsible. Learn as much as you can. There's a fork in the road. You decide which fork to go. For building functionality and building features, that last responsible moment totally makes sense. Learn as much as you can. But the news flash for things like performance and security is sometimes the last responsible moment is up front. Yeah? I have a real hard time with clients. I say, um, what, what's the security um, profile here? And they go, oh, yeah, make it secure. I'm like, yeah, no, but what is it like a government-backed system? Is it mom-and-pop store? What's the deal? They kind of think. I have to push a lot. Um, modern platforms, things like Docker, Kubernetes, modern architectures, where we've got more things in the mix, more languages potentially, don't make this easier. And I think it's very easy to get the whole broken windows thing sometimes, yeah. You know, show me to fix it right or fix it fast. Yeah, we'll just fix it fast. It goes downhill pretty quickly. Yeah. Hopefully perfect to time there. So in summary, a few things to take away. Docker and Java, great combination of technology. Do understand with anything in the mix here, things change. We as engineers need to take responsibility and adapt. Yeah? Continuous delivery, I think, is essential with the pace and the security and the stability challenges we as an organization, well, sorry, we as an industry have. Container images are now your single source of truth. Build them early, build them once, test them in the pipeline. That's the key thing, message today, really. Having sort of metadata for providence and validating NFRs of builds is vital. Respect in your team that not all developers are operationally aware. It's not a problem. It is what it is. We need to design the organization accordingly or train people accordingly. That's, that's what I'm saying. Recognize where you're at. Recognize where you want to get to and put steps in to get there. The shameless plug again, but the book does kind of give a whole chapter on how to do that kind of stuff. So, you know, please support my kids through college, I think. We're really good there. But, um, uh, yeah, please do, like, check out the stuff. You're welcome to get in contact with me on the interwebs. I'm, I'm pretty busy, but I try and respond to everything. So um, love to chat to folks online as well. So thanks for your time today. Appreciate that. Thank you.